Bueno, bueno, ¿escucha? Sí, excelente. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Pablo Montemayor Lozano. I'm a fourth year resident from the specialty of radiology at the University Hospital here in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, and I'm going to present you my interesting medical case. Uh, the case, uh, well, the patient uh, was a 10-year-old female with diagnosis of tubular acidosis. The an ultrasound was requested to assess the renal morphology due uh, due an alteration in the in the renal fu function. Uh, so at the ultrasound, we found the kidneys; uh, they were normal in shape and size, but uh, the the relevant finding was that they have an uh, augmented echogenicity of the renal medulla the, that we can see here. Here's the, here's the, the augmented echogenicity. Oh, I'm going to use. Here, here's the, the renal medulla with uh, the augmented echogenicity. And even uh, we can, uh, we also find uh, some uh, acoustic shadowing here. That uh, well, this uh, indicate to us uh, the presence of, of calcium. The well, the bladder was uh, was normal. Uh, so with the uh, with the findings and the, the 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 diagnosis of the of this patient, we we made an. Uh, well, we we roll out this uh, as, a, as a as a diagnosis of of medullary nephrocalcinosis. Okay, so what is the medullary nephrocalcinosis? Uh, the definition: Well, it's uh, it's a calcification of the renal parenchyma. Uh, the the most common causes of of this pathology are hyperparathyroidism. Type one uh, tubular renal acidosis. Uh, well, this is the the most important cause. This is this accounts for uh, uh, at least 40 percent of the cases, and the uh, tubular renal acidosis and the medullary sponge kidney they share uh, well 20 and 20 percent. Okay, uh, this this is uh, this pathology. It, it's asymptomatic. It don't, don't well. It's asymptomatic. It, uh, the age of presentation. It's there's no, there's no, uh, well, it, it can occur at, at any age, but it's, uh, it's kind of more uh, frequent in males. The, the incidence is pretty rare. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, from 0.1 to 1.6 percent. And there are two types of, of nephrocalcinosis, the medullar and the cortical. In this case, we saw the medullar, which is the most common. And uh, but there are there's also the cortical nephrocalcinosis that uh, this uh, this uh, happens in another pathologies. Okay, so the prognosis and, and treatment of of this the this uh, pathology it depends totally on the cause of, of this big why but well but because uh, it's uh, the the etiology or the 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 causing uh, problem here is it's uh, it's uh, different, okay. Well, wh what are the the findings in ultrasound? We can find like our patient. Uh, we can find an increased echogenicity of the renal pyramids, and we uh, in the early stage there will be no acoustic shadowing, but. Uh, uh <coughs> Uh, when this uh, the the time uh, uh, when when it's more well when the time passes the 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 amount of calcium will will start to cause the acoustic shadowing. Uh, so uh, we have an uh, also an Im inverted corticomedullary differentiation, and uh, the er it can be also necrosis of the renal uh, papilla like this example here. Uh, and how it's going to present the, the, the papillary necrosis. It presents as a, a papillary edema, uh, cavitation, and, and we can s and see that the papilla is like uh, falling or it, it can be torn and cause, and cause uh, obstruction. Okay. 
uh, well, uh, in, in next the X-ray, uh, we can uh, we will find a coarse calcification in the renal topography, and this uh, this calcification will will draw the the shape of the the renal medulla. We we can like this example here. We see all the all the the metal of the kidney with with the coarse calcifications. Uh, on the CT, the it's uh, the 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 same finding that the X-ray, but we can uh, we can uh, 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 see it, uh, watch it well, see better. Uh, uh, we we see the, uh, the well, and here we need to do an an, an simple CT because uh, with the uh, contrast and change CT, we it can be kind of well, it will be not difficult to find the diagnosis, but it will no it will no show as show as good as here on the on the non unchanged CT. Uh, well, in children the or the pediatric population, uh, the best diagnostic tool is the ultrasound, and even in the in the adults, the, the uh, with the ultrasound, it's it's uh, it's enough to do the diagnosis. Uh, uh, in adults, the CT can be used, but it's not uh, uh, recommended because of the 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 the, the radiation. And well, if e another thing to have in uh, in account is that if you want to increase the sensitivity sensitivity to to diagnose in, uh, or well to find calcifications in the in the X-ray, uh, you need to lower the KB. Okay. Well, uh, there's a mnemonic for for the causes of, uh, of nephrocalcinosis, it's, uh, you can say like ham hop. It's, uh, it's uh, the, what the, the, the thing that we said before, it's hyperparathyroidism, uh, renal tubular acidosis, medullary sponge kidney, hypercalcemia or hypercalciuria, oxalosis and papillary necrosis. The well, the differential diagnosis are mm, well. There, there are some. Uh, the the left end we find uh, here at the left we find uh, uh, kidney stones, which can give uh, some acoustic shelling, but uh, well, it can be look uh, like like the the diagnosis, but you need to know the 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 the, the medical history of the patient. Uh, uh, we have also cortical nephrocalcinosis here, which is uh, uh, well, it's uh, the opposite of the of the other, the the medullary nephrocalcinosis in, in the finding. But well, the the the, the etiology of this is uh, sepsis. Uh, that's, uh, there are a lot of, of causes like sepsis, drugs, uh, 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 venomous spider uh, biting, and chronic glomerulonephritis, and uh, also the uh, another uh, uh, differential diagnosis or, or something that can cause an image like or the findings can be uh, similar on ultrasound, it's uh, going to be the uh, emphysematous uh, philanthritis, but the difference here is that we, ha we have a dirty shallowing, not the acoustic shallowing that you find in the, in the, in, in the, well, the nephrocalcinosis. That's everything. Thank you.
flecha, ¿verdad? Good morning. Um, I am a, a radiology resident. And my name is Carla Yvonne Chavez Blanco. And I'm going to present my interesting medical case. Uh, a 24 year old female with no relevant medical history came to the assessment for presenting progressive pain in upper quadrants of the left breast after my trauma. And uh, ultrasound was mowed and at the axillary regions. We found lymph nodes with the normal morphology and alien preserved. At the breast examination, we found uh, that the tissue uh, a cotexture of both breasts was heterogeneous glandular component, and there were no cystic or solid image uh, at the time of, of the examination. And the only positive finding was located at the subcutaneous cellular tissue of the anterior aspect of the thoracic wall of the left breast. We found uh, the, uh, a tubular structure which uh, was also serpentinous and hypochoic. And in the Doppler color mode, this structure does not present a uh, flow signal inside. And this finding represents uh, a thrombose vein. Uh, which characteristic uh, of Munder disease. The Munder disease uh, is, the rare, uh, is a rare condition which involves thromboflevitis of the superficial veins of the breast and anterior chest wall uh, if sometimes uh, occurs in the arms or penis. In this image, uh, we note uh, a cord in the inner left breast. Uh, the Munder disease uh, is most commonly involves upper outer or upper inner quadrant or inferior breast and chest wall. And also uh, the thoracopigastric, lateral thoracic, or super epigastric veins, which involves thromboflevitis uh, of the superficial veins. Uh, the clinical issues in this uh, pathology, uh, the patient with this disease often have abrupt onset superficial pain, uh, may have associated with tender skin retraction the implant yellowish, yellowish of purplish discoloration. And it can be incidental finding on the screening mammogram. This entity is a benign and self-limited process. Um, uh, and the uh, associations uh, with this disease is trauma, bi biopsy, breast surgery, exercise, uh, botulinum toxic, to toxin or oral or injection, and uh, hypercoagulable status. And this uh, pathology present in 75% in women, but does occur in men, usually in 20 to 5 years. Um, the imagining, imaging findings, uh, we can see uh, the superficial tubular of bedded structure in the mammography and ultrasound, uh, we can see a tubular structure, hypo, 
or anechoic uh, lack of compressible of bane. Mm, yeah, um, the color or power Doppler no flow, no flow or minimal flow. The treatment is uh, symptomatic with conventional analgesia. No indication for antibiotics or anticoagulants. The differential diagnosis with this pathology um, are intraductal papilloma. We can see intraductal mass uh, near nipple, the, the light of around the lesion. And intrachistic, intrachistic mass, fluid diverse level, and circumscript or indistinct oval around mass. Uh, in the Doppler color, may reveal hypervascular stalk. Other diagnosis is the ductal carcinoma, and this pathology is associated with malignant appearing calcification in the mammography. In the ultrasound, uh, this pathology presents dilated ducts and architectural distortion. It can be uh, also associated with axillary adenopathy. Another differ differential diagnosis is duct ectasia. In the mammography findings, we can see calcifications around the ducts. And the ultrasound delighted subarial ducts and an echoic fluid, hyperchoic uh, debris. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Continuing with the case review series, uh, we will see today this uh, case review of a male newborn, product of the sixth gesti by C-section. This was this baby boy was born premature um, at 26 weeks via emergent C-section due to preterm um, uh, delivery uh, of the mother. Um, he presented with decreased tone at the moment of birth, respiratory stress and desaturation, with uh, a birth very low birth weight of uh, 100, um, uh, 1,200 grams, uh, a very poor, poor scale of APGAR with 3.5. The mother was 27 year old and she referred to obstetric examinations with a very poor uh, prenatal control and five ultrasound scans were that she refers normal, but we do not have evidence of this. And she referred also a previous abortion two years ago with an unknown cause. The routine maternal serology done uh, in our institution at admission for this cause for, for uh, delivery tested positive for syphilis with a dilution of 1.28, uh, that it's really high. And because of this positive result, uh, the previous newborn test was made uh, also with a VDRL and also came out positive with a dilution, uh, a higher dilution, but also positive with one in, in 3200. This is uh, his test that came out positive. This is our patient that 
the clinical features of important to us, it's a low set ears, a short neck, and large abdomen with a hepatomegaly clinically explored, and that's pretty much all. That same day, radiographs were performed. We are uh, visualizing frontal radiograph of the extremities. Uh, the examination is limited um, as no true frontal uh, view uh, was performed secondary to the patient position. There is, um, we can see periostitis involving the diaphysis or diaphysis and metaphysis of both uh, umeri, radi, ulna, and as well as both femurs, and, and tibia and fibula. There is also lucency uh, along the metaphysial region of all the lung bones, um, and uh, consistent with the provided history of uh, positive VDRL test, this is pos um, uh, uh, this is uh, positive for a congenital syphilis. A detailed evaluation of the tibial metaphysis is limited, uh, as I mentioned before, secondary to the patient positioning, but um, oh, are we therefore we cannot see the presence of erosions along the proximal tibia, that it is classified as a Wimbert sign, we will see it that later, and um, this cannot be assessed. There is no evidence of pathological fractures in these projections, only the lucencies of the metaphysis that I referred previously, and um, the periostitis, generalized periostitis of the long bones. With these uh, findings, an abdominal ultrasound was required uh, several days after these uh, radiographs findings, and um, these are the most important uh, images or representative images of the study. And we can see a decreased echogenicity of the liver, uh, generalized, with increased echogenicity with the periportal spaces. This, uh, the liver was of normal size according to the patient age. And this is uh, consistent with uh, uh, hepatitis. And we can see also free fluid within the abdomen um, surrounding the liver and, and free uh, in, in, the, in the lower fossa. We can see also uh, uh, both kidneys that were of normal size and normal morphology, but the echogenicity was increased in, in, in the parenchyma with also dilatation of the, um, of the pielocalicial space. Um, in, the, in this clinical context, we can um, assume this patient has sepsis or, or systemic uh, involvement because we can see involvement of the kidneys with a probable glomerular nephritis, free fluid, and hepatitis. The uh, spleen and liver measurements will, were normal for the patient age. Due to, we had uh, systemic manifestations of, of congenital syphilis, um, and transfontanel ultrasound was required several days later, and we can see uh, in, in the coronal planes how the leptomeninges are with increased echogen echogenicity, and also the subarachnoid space is with um, or has an, an increment of the echogenicity, and with the Doppler color flow, the signal is prominent. So. In this particular case, and um, adding up all the findings we have, this is a congenital uh, syphilis case. Although we have uh, antibiotics now, it is not rare to see these, um, these cases in our hospital due to poor uh, prenatal uh, control. Congenital syphilis, it's an inutero infection, uh, and it results for a transplacental transmission of the maternal infection uh, of the spirochete, the treponema pallidum, to the, the, the product or the, the baby. And we have two clinical manifestations. What is one is the early, early onset that manifests before the two years uh, of age, and the late onset when 
the baby's born asymptomatic and two years later he or she manifests the clinical um, findings. Uh, due, uh, the the ep epidemiology, it's pretty rare due to the antibiotics we have now, but I we can still see it. Uh, in the year 2012 to 2014, we had an incidence of 8.4 to 11.6 cases in every 100,000 live births. The presentation of this disease is, uh, it's, um, it depends on the onset of the, of the manifestations, if it's early before the two years of age or a late onset. And nearly 60% uh, of infants will be asymptomatic at, the, at birth and then develop uh, clinical manifestations. When we have an early onset, there's a lot of of clinical manifestations we can have. In, in the case of a patient, we only had bone manifestation or skeletal manifestation, leptomeningitis, and syphil syphilitic glomerulonephritis. This is very rare to see, uh, uh, although congenital syphilis is still present in our, in our, uh, in our hospital. It is very rare to see uh, early onset of, the, of this disease. We, uh, if these uh, children survive, we often see late onset of, of, the, of this disease. And other manifestations or symptoms, the most classical uh, symptoms is the Huntington triad, that is manifested by Huntington teeth, interstitial keratitis, and sensorineural hearing loss. Also bone changes where, where that I uh, referred previously. By the imaging findings, the most common finding we will see is uh, periostitial reaction or periostitis. And in the long bones, we will see affection of the metaphysis with horizontal loosened bands, irregularity of the metaphysis uh, traduced or, or we can see serrated or saw to uh, irregularities. The Weinberger corner sign that this is a um, um, bilateral destruction of the proximal medial tibias that in our, in our case we weren't able to see it because of the, um, of the patient position. Also we can see pathological fractures and in the diaphysis we can see cortical thickening, destructive lesions. In skull we can see multiple lithical varial lesions or lesions and in the thorax, we can see diffuse pulmonary opacities, and uh, as previously described, we can see pneumonia alba, that is, uh, this is um, a complete opacification of the lung due to pneumonia. Uh, the in this case, we can see all, all, all bone findings, or all skeletal findings. We can see uh, metaphyseal lucent bands in the radius and ulna, and uh, also periostitis um, and excuse me periostitis and a destructive lesion of the metaphysis of the distal radius these are another examples of the findings we can see we can see periostitis of the long bones uh, loosened um, metaphysial bands that this can also also be confused or or um, uh, with uh, uh, child or trauma uh, abuse. In the chest and abdomen, we can see that this is another finding that we don't see it very frequently because of the, of the treatment we now have, but uh, alba pneumonia is clinically manifested by a complete opacification of both emithorax. And in the knee here, we can see uh, this is an anterior posterior radiograph uh, of the knee that shows erosive destruction of the medial tibial metaphysis and medial distal uh, femoral uh, metaphysis as well as periosteal reaction. And this all uh, is part of the same spectrum of skeletal diseases or, or findings of congenital syphilis. 
Ultrasound findings are not non-specific and literature describes that uh, we can see um, these changes or, um, as in an obstetrical ultrasound. And part of this spectrum involves fetal hepatus plenomegaly, intrahepatic calcifications, placentomegaly, or fetal ascites. And postnatal findings include the most common hepatos plenomegaly, hepatic edema, uh, or hepatitis, are, are as in our case, and ascites. The differential diagnosis we should include is non-accidental trauma because of the healing classical metaphysical lesion. They kind of look alike with the loosened metaphysical uh, bands we see in congenital syphilis. Bacterial osteomyelitis should not be also um, forgotten, although these are usually monostotic. And leukemia, we can also see symmetric metaphysial lucent bands, osteoporosis and peri periosteal reaction, but uh, the clinical onset will be different with the uh, abnormal clinical blood count. This is an example of a non-accidental trauma with a, a classical metaphysial corner lesion or lesion. A bacterial osteomyelitis, when we can see a, um, a lucent uh, cortical defect, and uh, in the MRI we have another findings with bone marrow edema and uh, um, enhancement with, with contrast. And this is a case of leukemia where uh, metaphysial lucent bands are present, are as in our case, but this is due to a, a, a systemic involvement of leukemia. Diagnosis of the, this disease is with serology. In our institution, we do it by non treponal test, uh, VDRL. And the outcome of this patient is that uh, almost half of this patient will die in, in the first years of life. So prevention is very important or crucial with uh, treatment of seropositive mothers. In this case, the mother did not knew herself as infected, nor the father. And in retros retrospection, maybe that abortion she had a year ago could be explained uh, also for the or with the infection. The treatment of congenital syphilis it, uh, is with penicillin. And that is all. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Natalia Villarreal del Bosque. I'm going to talk to you about my case review. I'm a hair and neck imaging fellow, M the director of program of the hair and neck uh, program is the Dr. Mario Alberto Camposcoy. So I'm going to talk to you about an 18 years old male with history of recurrent otitis media during his childhood. He went to the hospital for headache, nausea, vomiting, nuchal rigidity, and altered al alternates. So the diagnosis of meningitis was performed. On, me on physical examination, tissue protruding from the external uh, right external auditory canal was found. So they, uh, the medical staff requested a, a CT of the patient. So we have an um, unenhanced CT, brain CT. Oh, sorry. OK. So I'm going to show you the uh, bone CT because the brain was normal. Oh. 
OK. I want to see you the, um, the ears of the patient. Look in the middle ear. There is a soft tissue mass who is occupying the entire middle ear. This, uh, this soft tissue density uh, is occupying the epitympanus, the mesotympanus, and the hypotympanus. Look the ossicles. The ossicles are laterally sides. There is um, this mass is in the medial aspect of the ossicle chain. Look the the other uh, normal portion of the of the ear of the patient. The right, the left ear as is normal. Look the ossicle chain is in the center of the middle ear. Okay, and in the right, the uh, ossicles are dis as laterally displaced in this portion. This is uh, the malleolus. So um, this uh, density extends uh, through the aditus at antrum to the, an to the uh, mastoid antrum. Look the normal mastoid antrum. Uh, look the size of the normal. There is expanded uh, uh, mastoid antrum in the right ear. Okay, so we are talking about a uh, mass who is expanded and eroded because look, the ossicular chain is uh, with uh, decrease of the density. This is the normal density of the ossicles. And look, this, there are uh, decrease of the density and also there is a, a eroded of the short process of the incus. Okay, look, uh, uh, we have as well, um, uh, the extent of the of this lesion to the um, external auditory canal. Look, there is also uh, occupied all the to the totality of the external auditory canal. Okay, uh, there is uh, some important findings here uh, that I want you to see. This is the uh, fascial nerve, the the the, mas the mastoid portion of the fascial nerve we can see the fascial nerve normal here. So there is two important anatomy um, uh, structures in the middle ear because uh, there is blinded to the surgeon. So this is the sinus tympanicum, the sinus tympani, sorry, medial to the, to the mastoid portion of the fascial nerve. And lateral is the um, fascial nerve recess. This, these uh, portions are important because uh, the surgeon cannot see this part of the, ma of the middle ear. So the involvement of these areas is important to um, uh, tell them in the report because the uh, high, frequency, high frequency of recurrence of the cholesteatoma in this case, okay? So we have a pars tensa cholesteatoma. We have, uh, because the dis lateral displacement of the ossicular chain, yes, and uh, the, er the erosion and the expanded um, imaging we have. So the patient has meningitis. Uh, also we, ha we know, we um, see, there is under pneumaticide mastoid. Okay, and there are secretion in there. So we also have uh, uh, chronic and acute otomastoiditis. Okay, can may be the, the etiology of the mani meningitis of the patient. So um, an MRI, a contrast MRI was performed in this patient. Just a few days later, they want to know if there is uh, some alteration of the of the brain. So in the MRI, the brain was normal, but I want you to see the the middle ear. The, this is a T1 weight images. This is the gadolinium post gadolinium T1 weighted image. The Fiesta. This is a T2 sequence and the um, 
TWY um, image. Okay? Sorry. Okay. Okay, this is the T1 post contrast. This is the, the on enhancement, uh, on uh, non contrast uh, T1, and this is the Fiesta. Look that in the middle ear there there are um, hyper intense uh, signal in the um, in the T2 uh, sequence and. There is a. Uh, let me. Oh, okay. Uh, there is. Okay, this is the middle ear. There is a, a, a high sonance uh, image, who ha doesn't have enhancement in this uh, uh, posterior portion of the of the image. Look, there, there has enhancement in the uh, most anterior portion of the middle ear. Maybe this is uh, granulation tissue or an uh, acute uh, otitis, okay? And uh, um, we have a reduced diffusivity of this portion, so we can uh, say that this is, this is a cholesteatoma, okay? But look in the internal auditory canal. There, uh, there is an enhancement of the internal auditory canal. So why we have enhancement here and doesn't have enhancement in the inner ear? Well, if we see carefully, look this um, Petrus apex, we have also enhancement of the apex of the, apex of the petrus petrosal apex. So maybe the infection uh, is a spread is spread in the through this uh, structure, and the uh, in this uh, in this uh, side we have maybe a meningitis adjacent to the uh, petro, uh, to the ap petrosal apex, and has this uh, meningeal enhancement in the internal auditory canal. This is the only. Uh, manifestation of the meningitis of the patient. Uh, we have a subtle um, uh, enhancement here too, but uh, the rest of the of the brain was normal. Okay, so we have um, cholestatoma with uh, otitis and otomastoiditis and meningitis in this patient. So the patient was uh, uh, um, a mastoidectomy was performed. And finally, we go to my case. <laughs> so um, a mastoidectomy was performed. I'm going to uh, show you the same images. And one month later, we have this image. In the sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, we can see in this um, in this study there is um, mastoidectomy. Okay, and I want uh, you to see now the inner ear. This is the mastoidectomy, 
and note the inner ear in this image. This is a normal inner ear, okay? This is the uh, semicircular canals, there is uh, the vestibule, the cochlea, there is water in there because they have endolymph and perilymph, okay? But look in the, in the uh, right side, there is no signal, the no water signal, so we have an image there is hypointense in T2 weighted image, hyperintense in uh, T1 weighted image in this portion of this, and has a little enhancement, not all of the inner ear, but they have enhancement. This is the vestibule and the uh, horizontal uh, semicircular canal. So what is hypointense in T2 and hyperintense in T1 in the on enhanced in the in the no contrast T1 their blood here and also there is an enhancement so we we uh, uh, see we are we are seeing with with um, these patients have an intralabyrinthine hemorrhage with labyrinthitis Okay, due to the meningitis and the uh, uh, mastoidectomy of the patient, many risk factors has this patient to 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 per to has this this alteration. The the uh, there is persistent of the enhancement of the in the internal of the uh, auditory canal. Yes, uh, but it's uh, uh, decreased that in the in the previous um, study. Okay, so well, I'm gonna continue with my with my uh, case review. So I'm gonna talk you about the intralabyrinthine hemorrhage. There, there is also called the inner ear hemorrhage. There is blood with normally fluid-filled spaces in the labyrinth. The risk factors are trauma anticoagulant therapy, hematologic lesions lo like leukemia, sickle cell anemia, and another hyperviscosity syndromes. Neoplasms like endolymphatic sac tumors, and we have to remember that endolymphatic sac tumor that is associated with the bone hip uh, 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 disease, okay? Um, the most common sign and symptoms of the intralabyrinthine hemorrhage is acute onset of unilateral sensory neural hearing loss that has involved over hours or days. Other signs and symptoms are vertigo and ten tinnitus. The natural history and prognosis depends on the underlying condition and the treatment is uh, uh, treat, tr treat the underlying condition, okay? Um, with the uh, imaging findings, in MR we can see in the T1 non-contrast sequence, we have a hyper intense signal of the vestibule, of the vestibule or, or the cochlea or the semicircular canals. Okay, so there are blood in, this, in there. Okay, in the T1 post-contrast, we can see a high signal present, but we can, we need to remember that if the high signal is in the pre-contrast uh, image, so there is no a real enhancement, okay? okay. Um, there is important to perform a pre-contrast imaging, we all always do that, okay, but many centers make um, skip this, this, this imaging and it's important to perform it. So um, this is another um, example. Look the normal intensity of the inner ear. There is high so intense because it's fluid, okay? And it, this is the hemorrhage. There is hyper intense in the vestibule and in the cochlea. In the T2, this case is the same like uh, this case. So in the T2, there is variable. The signal, the signal is variable. We can uh, see a hypo-intense um, signal or a hyper-intense. This, 
this case is this case. Look at the hyper intense um, signal in the inner ear. The differential diagnosis of the intralabyrinthine MRH is the labyrinthitis. Our patients had both. So this is acute inflammatory or infection disease that of fluid filled spaces on the inner ear. No images is necessary because the clinical presentation is uh, classic, like unilateral sudden onset of sensory neural hearing loss. In the post-contrast imaging, we can uh, have enhancement. And uh, in the T1 and T2 is usually normal. Look, these are two T1 uh, post-contrast image, images that there have enhancement of the cochlea bilaterally. And look in this one, this uh, case, there is very, um, very similar to our case. They have enhancement of the cochlea, enhancement of the facial nerve, uh, enhancement of the um, uh, mastoid cells, and there also has enhancement of the internal auditory canal. So they have uh, meningitis too, okay? The other differential diagnosis is the schwannoma. We uh, know that there are schwannomas in the internal auditory meatus, but they can be schwannomas in the inner, uh, in the inner ear, and we need to remember that. The schwannomas uh, uh, are hypodense feeling defect in the T2-weighted image, like in this portion, like in, in this portion, and in the cochlea and in the vestibule, okay? And this portion have enhancement. Look, this, the cochlea are uh, have enhanced, the vestibule too, the vestibule, the, the, the uh, uh, facial nerve has enhancement. So this is a benign tumor arising for, Shanoma, the, for Schwann cells within the structures of the membranous labyrinth. In the T1 uh, post-contract image, there are focal intense enhancement. In the high-resolution T2 image, so Fiesta in our center, filling the fact with hyperdense perilymph, like in this part, this is the normal perilymph and this is a filling defect. E and uh, the intralabyrinthine schwannoma may be missed by excellent radiologists because they are not aware of, it of its existence. So we can keep in mind this diagnosis always if, uh, if we see a filling defect in the inner ear, always, okay? So in the, the last final differential diagnosis is the congenital intralabyrinthine li lipoma. We uh, can, um, we can, uh, we, we know that it is lipoma in the um, cerebrospontine angle, that the lipomas, like uh, fat, s uh, uh, present a suppress of, si of the signal in the fat, in the fat sat sequences, okay? So look in this, there are coexistence of the, e of the cerebral pontine angle lipoma and an intralabyrinthine lipoma here in the vestibule. Look that in the, su in the fat sat suppress the signal, okay? In this portion and in this portion it is, is this one. In this is another example of the same intralabyrinthine lipoma Okay, and, in, and a lipoma in the CPA, okay? That suppress, when this is a, a, a T2 uh, weighted images, uh, there, there is a filling defect in the inner ear and in the CPA too. In, in the um, CT, there is a, a fat density mass in the, uh, in the internal auditory meatus, okay? So, that's everything. Do you have any question? Okay, thank you. <laughs>